Alrighty, uh, everyone, welcome back to the Monroe Live podcast. I'm Kevin Hardy, and um, I work for Monroe here. I'm a, one of the design consultants. We do a lot of design for manufacturing, lean design, costing, and just overall kind of uh, architecture benchmarking for various products. And with me today is Toby Krauss, the co-founder of NCO of Lightchip. Um, yeah, Toby, thanks a lot for joining us. I know we've we've uh, talked to Ben, you know, in the past, or Sandy has about the Lightchip, and it's something that, um, you know. I'm, I'm personally kind of interested in, I think it's a, an interesting niche in this kind of whole segment for most, most specifically for me, because it's, it's powertrain like agnostic, you know, it's, it's a great help to EVs. It's and at this point, it's, it's no doubt that, um, you know, when towing, that's like a, the major drawback that a lot of people th- see with EVs. Um, but what's neat about this is that it doesn't matter necessarily what vehicle you have it tethered to, whether it's a, a, a PHEV, a gasoline vehicle, or, you know, an a full electric vehicle as well. So um, I'm very interested to kind of see where this whole segment in general um, goes to. So um, if we could, can we just start with a little bit of like your background, like, uh, you know, past companies and kind of how that led to Lightship? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me. Um, excited, excited to be here. Uh, I guess it's a little bit less fun being in a podcast studio than crawling <laughs> under the, the L1 like Sandy and Ben got to do. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here and tell you kind of like the other part of the Lightship story. There's, sure. there's, there's two of us co-founders and um, Ben and I have been working together for the last couple you know, of years and uh, it's, been, it's been a wild ride. Um, so, so yeah, and, and, and maybe just to touch on, on, a, on a point you're making um, because it's a, it's a really important one. Um, you know, we we've really designed this this vehicle to to be power you know powertrain agnostic. Right. Kevin and I are both EV people. Um, you know, we, we kind of came came together over the Tesla experience. We're, we're there for over a decade. You know, together. Um, and 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 while we are EV people, we also recognize we're just in the early phases of adoption. And and as we're designing a all electric product for you know the recreational vehicle space, it's super important for us to um, be a product that is awesome for. The incumbent fleet of vehicles and and like you know the, the new wave of electric vehicles so um, i'm glad i'm glad you kind of keyed in on that um so yeah my my, my quick background and and how, how how i got here um who the heck i am so i um gosh let's see i've been i've been doing electric vehicles basically my whole career i, I suppose I, I i started off um as a as a finance guy i was an investment banker morgan stanley uh, this is going back to the last financial crisis uh, 2000, 2007 2009 um that was a fun time to, to, fun right. time to be in finance uh, for folks that are, are like deeply involved in the automotive industry. Um, uh, it was a fun time to be in the automotive industry. I'm, I'm also kidding here in terms of <laughs> the fun time being in, in both finance and automotive. This is like this is a rough time. Right. Uh, t- you know, t- two, two of the of the three largest American uh, manufacturers that just gone out of business. Uh, General Motors and Chrysler Ford barely, you know, squeaked right, by. Barely. Um, and for some reason, yeah, after a couple of years of of working as an investment banker, I, you know, learned pretty quickly. That was not for me. Like did, did not like that. Um, learned a lot, but you know, that was, that was, that was not my, my thing. Um, for some reason I thought it was a good idea to go work in, at a car company, um, in that, in that climate and, uh, a, a startup car company, not, no less. Um, and, uh, so I went over to, to Tesla is back in 2009. Um, Tesla was a 450 person company that no one had really heard of and was, you know, on the brink of, of, of going out of business. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of well into a different chapter of Tesla history, but this was, this was, this was, uh, this was something different. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I went over to Tesla. I was, I was a uh, Tesla for about six years. Um, I, you know, as I, as I mentioned, kind of like r- really kind of like, you know, fi- finance and sort of, uh, sort of biz- business commercial background. So, um, I was hired as the first finance analyst to work on Tesla's IPO. Um, back then, which was, was you know super cool project, um, and then I you know stuck around. I would I'd lead lead the finance team um, for for a few years there, and and then I actually, have, I've I've the the joke I guess at Lightship is as I'm a an engineer comma non practicing uh, right <laughs> college, and though I have been doing sort of finance and business stuff, I'm always fighting to get back closer to the engineering. Sure. And, so the, the last thing I actually did was with at Tesla is um, I moved out of the finance team and I became uh, the product manager, product lead for the Model S, uh, the very first Model S, the, the big black fish mouth Model S you still see, see driving around from time to time. Um, super, you know, that was also super awesome. Got to launch the very first you know, version of dual motor, the very first, right. first version of autopilot. 
Um, uh, so that was that was great. And then um, uh, moved moved on from Tesla and uh, stuck stuck with EVs. Though I went to go work at another, at another EV company called Proterra. Okay. Um, now working on you know large commercial EVs, um, and uh, my my role there was really uh, starting and then leading what we called Proterra Powered, which was their you know powertrain technology business. So. Proterra's core product was a, an electric transit bus, you know, I think like a okay. municipal city, city bus. Um, and, um, and, and, and what I was doing is basically taking that core technology that was developed for that product is a big class eight vehicle, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, s- deploying it or selling it through a partnership model to all sorts of commercial vehicle manufacturers, um, you know, the world over, um, got to work on a ton of cool programs. Our, our biggest customer was Daimler, you know, parent company of Mercedes Benz and, um, I was really focused on the heavy, heavy side. So I think like Freightliner trucks, uh, Thomas built buses, they own Th- Thomas built buses, which is the largest school bus brand in the United States, Freightliner custom chassis, which does all of the, um, they're, you know, the, the market leader, uh, for, uh, what are called step vans, basically like U- UPS trucks, are all Daimler products. So did a ton of cool electrification products. Um, and that was my, uh, you know, real, really kind of first exposure to RVs actually, um, didn't really understand the industry well, well at sure. that point. I, I was I was kind of intrigued, but um, you know I thought it was kind of small. I hadn't done a lot of RVing myself growing up. I you know, love the outdoors, but um, frankly overlooked it. Uh, and it wasn't until um, uh, about a year later, after I'd, I left Proterra, kind of the beginning of the pandemic, that Ben and I got uh, connected. Ben, Ben, you know the other the other uh, co-founder, um, and he. Uh, he, he had, you know, he has his, his own fun journey, which I, I, I think he told Stanley about. But uh, just to summarize quickly, like he, you know, he was a battery engineer at Tesla. Right. Um, he started out working on uh, an idea for an electric food truck um, okay. because at, at uh, Tesla's headquarters back in uh, Palo Alto, there's there's nowhere to eat lunch. So they bring sure. all these food truck food trucks in um, for, for the employees to eat. And Ben, uh, being the engineer that he was, was just absolutely bamboozled uh, by you know, having to order lunch and scream over a, you know, propane gen set um, to, to order his tacos or his panini uh, when, when I mean, you know, the, the battery technology that was needed to replace that was you know, like not 50 feet away. Sure. Um, so he, he, he worked on electrifying food truck basically on his own. It was, you know, really awesome nights and weekends product, I think, uh, project, uh, I think, um, you know, pretty cool technical feat. Pretty quickly he learned that like, the food truck industry is a is a small cottage industry of right. you know, family owned businesses. They they don't have a lot of capital. Uh, it's like about ten thousand or so of them are are made every year, and uh, this is not going to be a, a business that that had a huge impact. Um, and it wasn't going to be like a big you know uh, business venture, just right. generally speaking. Um, but he got really encouraged to to go and look into RVs because it's a lot of the same needs, and it's it's a vastly larger market. So he kind of took that that thread and got inspired enough to leave Tesla. Um, and took a 6,000 mile road trip through the American West, he fell in love with RVing, we had a ton of RVers. Um, and and right, basically right when he came back from that trip was when he and I met and I got the pitch from Ben, we're gonna you know f- start the first American electric RV manufacturer. And um, I'd like to tell you the rest was history, but, sure. but actually I was like, you're crazy. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> um, and uh, and the reason was, you know, going back to what I was saying, I, w- I was, uh, you know, I spent a lot, basically my whole career working on, you know, the electrification of ground vehicles and um, was kind of familiar with RVs, but sw- thought it was a small market. And, um, you know, but Ben and I got to talking and you know, took, 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 a, took a few conversations. But what I, what I learned, you know, what Ben, what ben knew then and I know now is, you know, you look at RVing and it, it is, um, it's truly a part of Americana. It's, 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 it's actually massive. Um, one in 10 American families owns an RV. Um, what I had thought was, was sort of a, you know, a small industry, what, what was, was actually kind of the smallest part of a larger industry. Sure. So I was thinking about what, what in the RV world you call a motor coach or a motor. Home. Right. So think like anything from, uh, on the small side of, you know, a sprinter van up to uh, on the larger side, a, a proper like coach vehicle. And as it turns out, like that is the smallest part of the market. You right. Know, that is 50,000 vehicles or so sold every year. Um, but if you take a step back, um, that's like 10% of the market. And it's actually about a half a million vehicles sold every year in the United States. Um, and it just so happens that 90% of them 
are what are called towable RVs, so something you're going to pull behind a truck or an SUV. Um, so think like an Airstream, not like a Sprinter van. Um, and that was uh, that was sort of illuminating um, in, in terms of just like the the size of of, of the opportunity. Um, and then I, th- I think the other important thing to, to talk about is, is, is sort of like a technical one, which is if you think about electrification, and I've been doing this for, for quite a while, um, you know, if you are Proterra, for instance, you know, you can electrify a, a, a massive coach. You can put 400 kilowatt hours or 500 kilowatt hours, or 600 kilowatt hours of batteries on a bus. And uh, you can sell to a municipal transit agency for three quarters of a million dollars. And that kind of pencils out because uh, municipal transit agencies get funding from the FTA. Um, it's not a consumer product. Right. Uh, or it's not a consumer product that you're, that you're going to sell a lot of. Um, and, and if you look and if you sort of, so, this, so in, in other words, like that's a really hard problem to solve for, for electrification. Um, but if you look at a towable RV, it's, it's completely different. Um, and, and for a towable, what you're, what you're looking at is electrifying everything inside the vehicle and then solving the towing efficiency problem. So, right. Uh, so the, that is when you are towing, um, you are either, you know, if you're behind a gas or a diesel tow vehicle, you're either getting terrible fuel economy, you know, seven or eight miles per gallon instead of 20 or 25. Or if you're behind an electric vehicle, the problem is very acute and you have, you have a range issue, you're 300 mile you know, F-150 Lightning or R1T that you just gotten or so proud of is actually getting more like 100 miles. Um, and, that, and that has a lot to do with, with the, the, you know, the drag and the mass of, of, of the tow vehicle. So you have to solve that problem. And we can get more into it, but, but uh, you know, the, the sort of punchline is that is a solvable problem for electrification. That doesn't require 400 kilowatt hours. Kilowatt of hours, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's, that, that's the long-winded way. I no, no, it's fine. Together and got started. Um, it kind of answered in some ways uh, one of my like my curiosities with like what like like Proterra for instance, and you kind of you touched on it with respect to like one of the big differences, especially from like a like a profitability and you know I would say even margins, but like you know aside from that and the ease of potentially selling things into the like the public sector at low volume, what, what would you say? Yeah, you know, before we kind of get more to Lightship, the biggest aside from that, the biggest difference between you know from Tesla then to Proterra and then Proterra then to with the Class Eight trucks and things of that nature then to like towables and things of that nature. Um, yeah, I'd say I'd say like the well, some similarities. I mean, are are actually before I talk about similarities, I, I think one thing that is kind of funny is like I started my career working on small commercial vehicles, or sorry, small small consumer vehicles. Then I worked on large uh, commercial vehicles, and so it felt only natural that the third step was to work on large consumer vehicles. Um, and and so that's m- maybe one common thread. The 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 um. I think the other common thread for me and why I kind of I, I kind of really you know sort of liked uh, going from Tesla to Proterra to uh, Lightship is for me it's always been about how do you how do you expand electrification um, into new demographics of people um, so 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 you know Tesla was was like an incredibly important company that I think they are in my opinion like the reason electrification is a thing. Um, and, and they've done, they've done, they've done so much, uh, to, to like inspire that movement. Um, but th- there, you know, there, there is, there's a bit of a stereotype who, you know, who drives a Tesla and like the, the penetration of, of Tesla products, like is not necessarily like, uh, yet going like in, into like the mainstream of our country. Um, uh, and, and so that's, that's cool. Um, flipping over to Proterra, I really like that because that was taking electrification to a completely new demographic of people. Um, in the you know in the transit industry like it, it's it's um sort of talked about that like uh transit or or, or you know t- you know buses like it's it's a transportation means uh, in many cases of last resort so you take a bus because maybe you don't have a car and so that's really cool now we're providing electrification to another big group of people and then now flip over flip over to, to lightship it's it's similar so like we're talking about um a, a a a user group that is vastly different from the first two user groups i mentioned you know these are people who Maybe they don't live in cities or coastal regions. Like they drive a a, a Ram fifteen hundred sure. or something like that, and and we're building an electrification product for them. So so that that's I, that's I'd say like um, the, the the commonality. The difference is I think was actually you know your your question and 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 th- those are yeah. those are those are pretty pretty significant too. I, I mean I think the thing that really inspired me to like come back to um, 
you know, consumer vehicles in the form of our being is like, that, that is something that I just find like very um, inspiring. Like in, in the commercial vehicle sector, it really is, uh, it's, it's all about like TCO, total cost of ownership. Like it is a util, you know, t- utilitarian use case. So it's, it's just about like getting the most economical product possible. And that, right. is, that is what, win, what wins. Um, but if you're, if you're a kind of a product person and, and, and I, I, you know, going back to like, um, you know, uh, engineer common non-practicing, like I sure. do, I do love, love <laughs> products, like, like, I think, I think, um, products are really powerful and that's something that, that, that I, that I, that I, I learned, you know, at, at Tesla, like the reason Tesla was so successful is because they built a vastly better product and, and you know, it happened to be a sustainable product. Um, but why it was so successful is because the product just kicked ass. Um, and, and, and because the product had gas, that was sort of the engine for change. And I think there's exactly the same opportunity here, uh, in, in recreational vehicles where we can make a product that is just better and, and we can be, um, we can have a very big impact by making a better product. Um, and we can, and we can, we can, you know, appeal to many different people there, there, this is not like a, um, you know, is is not like a. I think that's how you penetrate to like new demographics of people. Like it's not a political thing. It's just like everybody wants a better product, right? Yeah. No. It's it's like I said. I kind of start out. I, I'm the whole thing is very interesting to me because when we got our when we first got our Rivian, we did like a little tow thing with it, and we use some people's trucks around here. So I have a diesel F one fifty, and um, it gets when I first bought it. You know, just stock tires and stuff like that. You know, I got like 33 miles per gallon on the highway with it, which is pretty impressive. And it's not a very heavy truck either. Um, being it's essentially like an unobtainium base model, um, that somehow I found at a dealership, like I couldn't order it as a normal person. Um, it'd be like, I think Lariat or higher is what you'd have to do as a normal, normal person at the time. Um, and then I leveled it because I like to off road, and you know I was planning this trip out west, um, and it's on thirty five inch tires now, but it still gets relatively good fuel economy. Uh, I took a much bigger hit than I thought I would uh, based off the previous truck, um, but it's an interesting. Um, the truck's been an interesting case study for me personally, just about what affects mileage and what doesn't. You know, I was expecting like a two to three mile per gallon hit with the tires based off the previous truck. It was six. You know, like I can get twenty six, and sometimes a little bit more if I if I really work for it. Uh, but typically I won't based off of, you know, wind or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, state of the, um, the def filter, like, um, oh, that's not scavenging, but essentially when they're, um, going into regen and cycling out the particulate filter. So, um, and that's, it's something interesting from that perspective. So we, we did this little toe test. We kind of like ran some rough numbers and, uh, like, you know, one of the things that people kind of criticized us on is like, oh, well, you, you took this diesel truck on essentially like a non-highway route, you know, not where they do well. Um, and, uh, with this particular travel that Corey owned at the time and at the time, actually it technically already belonged to a friend of mine in Pennsylvania. And I was literally going to bring it down the following that weekend, I think to him, um, so it's, it's interesting to see from, from me, from like the towing perspective, like that, that truck gets pretty good mileage. I can get, you know, 550 plus miles per gallon for a tank with it. Um, but towing the travel all, which I want to say with that trailer all in was like 75, 7,600 pounds. It still did okay. You know, it was 13, but it's, I mean, it's literally half. Um, I mean, I could still drive farther than like a Rivian could like unladen, which is interesting, but, um, you know, this kind of whole aspect of the, the power trailer thing is is interesting to me, not necessarily because of the of the mileage gains, but I think you're you're also talking about, and I don't know a lot about the, the emission side of, of things, but you're talking about, you know, use cases for vehicles that arguably are the the dirtiest for them, you know, uh, when they're pulling things heavy and things of that nature. And and as a non, you know, native Michigander myself, we have this like phenomena of, of going north, which I kind of didn't realize, you know, uh, wherever you're at, like on the, here, where's the camera? You know, we're down here, but every weekend, everyone goes this way. It doesn't matter how, where you're at in the state, everyone goes here. And then, if you're, you know, the Upper Peninsula as well. And to your point, like with the trailers, you'd see it just nonstop, just, you know, small little Jamins and things like that, all the way up to fifth wheel trailers and RVs driving up and, think, you know, every weekend, Starting around Thursday, you start seeing this mass migration going north with these trailers. So, I thought it was um, it's it was pretty interesting, and I've always kind of wondered, and it's a, you know, question I want to ask you, but like, um, 
you know, obviously I think it's like a, what, an 80 kilowatt hour pack that um, the light chip will have. Yep, that's right. Yeah, 80 kilowatt hours. Yep. You know, um, and obviously it's not in production yet, or, um, but like what is, like how how far would you have to tow or, be, be, you know, have it push your vehicle before it offsets, you know, at a high level? And I think this is kind of well suited to, you know, the product and the and the number side of things. Um, maybe it's it's like it's, it's carbon, like a uh, footprint that it has, you know, which is like a big thing, I think, with EVs in general. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah, so there, there, there's a lot there. So I'd say, you know, the, the product is designed to, or maybe even taking a step back further, like our, our experience with driving a lot of vehicles and electric vehicles and going on road trips and going camping and going RVing is that like um, 300 miles is kind of the magic number. Like, like you need, you need to have, have a range of about 300 miles. That's why, that's why a lot of like the vehicles that are coming out, we are, they're sort of like um, uh, all triangulating to like around a 300 mile range. And, um, and that, and, and why that's the magic number, like, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you exactly, but um, you know, I think it's probably like how, how long is it comfortable to go on a trip yeah, before you want to, you know, be, you know, stand up and stretch your legs and go to the bathroom. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we, we've been really focused on designing the light ship to allow you to have a 300 mile range. Um, and, 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 and so, so that's sort of like how we think about sizing the battery. So, so while you're, while you're driving, what's happening is you're, you are not losing any, um, you know, any fuel economy. And, uh, and if you have an electric, you know, electric vehicle, you're not losing any range. So, so, so the emissions are, are, uh, are you know no 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 worse than than they would be when you are unladen. Um, now they are much better uh, than than you know sort of like the the the, the parallel when you know you're trying to tow something, um, and, and 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 so I think that's that 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 is like that's like part of the impact uh, yeah. story. But um, you know I, I think your your question is like more about like the the total like embedded emissions um, in in. Uh, you know, producing the vehicle. Yeah, I mean, how, how long it does, uh, how long it takes to like, you know, pay, you know, pay back there. Sure. And I can't tell you that we've done like a, a thorough study uh, of, of that like specific data point. Um, and, and and frankly, I think like I haven't I haven't actually seen great studies done for just like any electric vehicle. Like, you know, it, I think anecdotally I've heard it's like somewhere between like four and maybe like six years or something like like that. And and I think like. I can't, I can't tell you what our exact number is, but, but I, what I can tell you is like, what we're, what we're really focused on is when it comes to sustainability, um, is, is actually like, it's like, it's like a slightly different conversation, which is, which is, you know, which is, which is, which is, we are, we are really focused on, um, one of our sort of like core company values we say is build to last. So, so, so like, um, if you, if you like compare a light ship to a conventional RV, the, the sort of like dirty truth in the RV industry is that most RV industries are sorry, most RVs are, are kind of like, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say it's like intentional, Hot garbage. In way, but, but the, you know, you're, <laughs> so. you're saying, you're saying not me, yeah. um, they're, 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 they're kind of designed to fail. And, 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 and when you really get down to it, we've, we've sort of like heard this from kind of like RV industry insiders, like your average RV gets used like 50 times, sure. 60 times and then ends up in a landfill. Um, we're trying to design a product that is really like a generational asset. Like this is something that, um, that is going to be passed down you sure. know, from, 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 you know, parents, to their kids and, and last a really long time. Um, so, so, so what that means from sort of like the embedded emission standpoint is, um, you know, we, we haven't, we haven't chased down to like the, the atom or the gram, like all of the, all of the emissions in our supply chain. I, I can't, I can't tell you that, but what I can tell you is that if you compare us to the status quo, it's going to be vastly better. And the reason it's going to be vastly better is, is, is actually because of, uh, of the denominator of this equation, which is like how many times you get, you're going to use this RV before it's, ob you know, obsolete, um, is going to be vastly greater. And, and I didn't mean to, it wasn't meant to be kind of a gotcha question. I'm just kind of curious, you know, um, cause I think it's a, you know, obviously the, the whole EV thing gets very political, very fast. Um, but I think it's an, it's an interesting, you know, aspect to them, um, with respect to like how long you can use them. And I guess since, and I wouldn't expect, especially given, you know, like they're not in production yet and, you know, I'm not sure how many prototypes you have running around, 
you'd even necessarily have that information yet because if you're not if you're pro, you're i think was it like roughly 2024 you're thinking of getting your pilot facility up and running yep yeah we're, so we're, it's we're, it's we're almost impossible. In less than six months yeah so and that's not what i've just i'm just kind of curious from that if there was like a target in mind that you had that like you know we would be offsetting this kind of going forward but i guess the to your point about being a, like a true generational asset um then i guess from like a life cycle perspective how long would you are you are you trying to design for and uh, have this product last for um yeah we uh so one one maybe important thing to to to, to sort of talk about um sort of just in our in our approach is we are um really taking automotive standards and we're applying and we're applying them to a new a new industry okay um and uh and so if you look at um if you look at sort of like the RV industry as it exists today, like it, it's it's more akin to um, to home building, really. Actually, correct. You know, like it's so, so, you can so, yeah, exactly. And um, what that what that really means is is like you think about like you know quality and durability standards that you're used to in a vehicle, and they they just don't exist in the RV industry. Um, so so like if you were to ask like an RV manufacturer, like you know what, what are the durability cycles that you tested your you know, uh, this component on, like, they would, they would say like, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, so, so, you know, for us, we're, you know, that, that, that's sort of the mindset and, um, we haven't announced sort of like our, our sort of like, you know, lifetime and our warranty and stuff like that, like that, that will be, that will be forthcoming. But, but what I will say is, is you should think about it much more in automotive terms where you're, you know, you're looking at a car that is like designed with, you know, a, uh, you know, 50,000 mile or a hundred thousand mile, like, uh, warranty on the vehicle or on the powertrain, like that, that will be our, that will be our approach. Um, and, and, and then when you compare that to the status quo, it's going to be, it's going to be much, much different. So, and you bring up an interesting feature about like, um, you know, automotive standards and, and quality. Um, you know, we, we work in all sorts of industries, you know, off highway products on highway, automobiles, toys, you know, you name it, we, we've worked in it. Um, is there, when you, are you thinking mostly from a, I guess, is there a subset of characteristics that you're looking to bring over from the automotive industry? Um, I guess the reason I ask is because we have seen like some people burden themselves excessively while trying to meet some of these things that the auto industry does because they are, you know, in volume cycles significantly higher than some of these other products. And they're, they're yeah. trying to replicate some of that stuff, but, um, yeah. You know the, the capital expenditure that some of these vehicle programs have is you know mind-boggling in comparison to some of these smaller you know low volume you know products so i guess uh you know what, yeah. what really are you trying to target from like an automotive perspective yeah no it's it's a it's a really good question um and 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 i think you also you mentioned a really good point which is like we're, we're talking about a sector that is like a, a different uh sort of order order of magnitude in terms of mm -hmm. so so like you know, easy to say that you're going to test something to hundred thousand miles or, or whatever, when you're, you're going to, you know, spend a billion dollars on launching a new sure. vehicle program or something like that. Um, so for us, I mean, I, I guess, I guess what I'd say is you have to be really smart about it. Um, so, so, so as a starting point, the, the standards are different in the RV industry as, as compared to the, compared, uh, as compared to the automotive industry. So, you know, both are vehicles that are, you know, regulated by NHTSA and the DOT, but, the standards are quite different because um, in the automotive case, you have to go through, you know, a full homologation program, crash testing, all of that. Um, in the RV case, for towables specifically, um, you are you are not allowed to have occupants in a towable. It's like it's, you know, regulated by the DOT. And so there's not the same, you know, homologation and crash testing standard that exists. There are still standards like you have to have a bumper and it has to be this high off the ground and, and things like that. So this, so, so the standards are are, are different, um, and then I'd say like to go to go maybe like one layer layer further, um, what what we do and in, in, in a lot of re, re, sort of reason or in a lot of ways like the reason we can exist is is because of the global automotive industry. So global automotive has put you know billions and billions of dollars into the development of very high quality components like high voltage batteries and uh, and drive systems and OVCs and onboard chargers. And, um, and we can benefit from that. In fact, we have to benefit from that. Like we, we, we cannot, uh, raise, you know, 
hundred you know billion dollars or whatever it's going to take to like develop all that stuff ourselves. Um, but we can rely on a, on a supply base that is that is quite robust. And all, each of that, those components um, goes through very rigorous uh, you know standards. And then what we're doing is we are we are we are putting we have to put it all together and then apply you know our own standard at sort of the vehicle level. And there and there is where I kind of go back to we have to be really smart about it. And what we're doing is we're, we're looking at like a combination of um, the standards that that, that exists, which um, in some cases are are um, you know statutory. In other cases are like in, industry standards. So so there's like the the RBI, the Industry Association, which has a lot of like recommendations. They're not they're not necessarily statute. Um, and then we're applying our kind of automotive experience uh, to to decide you know what what are the right you know testing regimens like what are the things that we need to do to to be you know really confident in the you know quality group and reliability safety of this product the most important thing that we do is is really related to functional safety which is also kind of a, a you know very sort of like automotive term like how right. do how do we absolutely ensure that, that our product is functionally safe um, and and that is where we you know obviously don't 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 make any compromises so when you you know, with respect to like a lot of the high voltage components um, and things of that nature. So it sounds like you're sourcing most of that, which I, I think is smart. You know, you don't necessarily want to get into like the wire bonding game or, and building a lot of your own stuff with that. With that, um, I'm not sure what your volume set is. And I, I don't even know if you, you have kind of a target there. But uh, I, to me, it sounds like it, it's not a good idea to try and pursue anything. Um, like I would say truly proprietary in a sense of like unique and designed in house or, um, you know, like a, something that you're delivering as a package to supplier to build for you. Um, like, you know, in some of the literature, it does, there's aspects that kind of discuss like a proprietary drive system, I guess, what, what then makes it proprietary if, if you're, and I, I think it's a good idea, leveraging essentially the supply base for existing off the shelf components. Is it the, um, you know, the aspect of how it's been a toe behind, which is essentially new and definitely not common, that's powered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what, what would you say it is you do? So so I, I would say, first of all, um, uh, we, 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 are, we, we don't leverage the supply base for everything. So, sure. so like if you, if you think about the Tesla approach, like the Tesla approach is like vertically integrate Very. down to the, to the atom. And I remember, you know, conversations uh, with, with Elon uh, related to, you know, largely related to like product cost. And, and Elon would always have this perspective of like, what is the cost of the atoms? Right. You know, like, like he doesn't care like what it costs to transform those ad atoms into like a printed circuit board or something. He's like, what is the cost of like the atoms? And, and so that's, that's one, that's one way to do it. Um, the other way to do it, I would say is like, um, you know, may maybe where the automotive industry was when it was kind of in a you know bad place, like, you know, 20 years ago where they had sort of like pushed everything out everything to suppliers and, and it was like literally like a, a, an exercise of like specking a vehicle and then you know plugging in all the pieces um and and i don't think that's quite right either and, and so for us we are a little bit more moderated so when so when you think about something like a, a battery pack um we don't we don't need to you know go vertically integrate down to like the, the cell level there's a, there's a really good supply base of high voltage rectilinear battery packs that you can package you know, in between frame rails. And, and so that's not something that's like smart for, our to go, for us to do ourselves. As you think about some of like the power electronics, we're doing actually something that's like really novel in that we're effectively combining a, um, an electric vehicle powertrain um, with a home solar system and a bunch of like AC appliances and consumer electronics. And like that hasn't quite been done before. And, and what that means is that we do have to invent some of our own hardware um, and many of our own controllers. And we definitely need to uh, invent a lot of our own software. Um, so so, so I, I would say probably the most proprietary thing that we do is all of the controls. Like we need to be able to integrate everything, everything together uh, very well, both things that we're sourcing and things that we're doing ourselves. And then um, we, we need to control it um, in a way that has sort of never been done before. And that kind of applies to both the, the living side of, of the you know the RV experience and even more so to the driving side. So you think about what it takes to control um, a, a a drive system that is that is really secondary to the primary drive system on your tow vehicle. Like how do you do that? Sure, that's that's never really been done before, and and that's something that 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 um, that we we've, we've spent a lot of time working on.
And I mean, it makes sense to me, right? Like, and those are the two use cases, right? Like, I don't want to say that the customer is not directly interfacing with the battery, but they're not necessarily, but they are interfacing with how it tows behind the characteristics of it behind your vehicle while you're towing it someplace. Um, and obviously once it's set up and you're boondocking or whatever you're doing with respect to that. Um, so it does make sense to like, to place a lot of emphasis there and the, um, and really kind of, and hammer that out. Um, I guess when you look at, um, so it looks like you guys are doing like a, a very composite intensive, you know, body structure, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, I think you're able to leverage a lot of OE like, um, design executions with essentially a, like a tooling burden that's lower, um, and a, and a, and a volume threshold that's much more, um, amicable to what you're probably going to end up producing. Um, can you talk a little bit about like your, the design selection of how you kind of built the overall, um, I don't want to say body structure, but like essentially the frame of the trailer itself. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's funny, like spending a lot of time in the automotive industry, you know, composite has like a, a certain like, uh, uh, sort of like aura it conjures when yes. you use that word, like in, yeah. in automotive, <laughs> in automotive, you hear composite and you're like, oh, that's probably like really expensive. And like, it was like really like, you know, it's like, you know, the Corvette used to have like a full composite body. Sure. You, you sort of, people thought you were crazy and doing something is too expensive if you're using composite parts. Um, and most cars, you know, you're made out of like, uh, you know, cast or, or stamped aluminum or aluminum or steel. Um, the RV industry is completely the opposite. Like most right. RVs are made out of composite and, and, and there actually it has a, has a, it conjures an image of, of being cheap, you know, where, where it's like, <laughs> what is the absolute cheapest way you could do something? And you, you know, yeah, like you make it out of composite. It's like, and, and, and I mean, what the word composite means, it's like, it's just like a, you know, a sandwich of, of things. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you, you'll have, you know, a layer, a layer of, you know, composite fiberglass and then you'll have, you know, an insulating layer and, um, and, uh, and there's also, you know, obviously like different kinds of composites that you deal with in carbon fiber, or you, like it's super expensive. And so, so I guess like fundamentally what, 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 what's sort of like behind all that is like, is it, it has a lot to do with volume. So, so, so like, you know, in global automotive, um, the, the, the sort of cheaper, cheapest way to do something is, is to, to do it, you know, with, with stampings and, um, stampings, like the unit cost is super cheap because it's just, you know, you know, rolled, rolled aluminum or steel. And the tooling cost is exorbitantly high. Like you know, you, you can you can you can spend tens of millions of dollars on like a, a, a single like progressive die set to to stamp out like body panels for a car. Um, we are, if you look at the RV industry, like you know, we are uh, you know for product one, we're talking like low, low thousands of units. Um, so it's it's not going to make sense for us to 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 build a body structure out of out of stampings. Um, and, uh, and also like we are going back to the, like the built to last thing, we're like, we're not trying to, to sort of like replicate the status quo of like how the RV industry uses composites. So, so we're, 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 um, we have, I, you know, a pretty, pretty unique approach. And, and also, um, for listeners who've like gone to our website, we have a pretty darn unique body too, um, because the whole thing, you know, compresses down. It has two, it has two modes. It has a driving mode where it's, you know, about, about you know, six and a half feet tall and it's you know, kind of tucked behind the, the tow vehicle. And then it has a camping mode where the entire top of the vehicle, we call the canopy, goes up to about 10 feet tall. Um, so, so, so like, you know, so that, that design sort of like also, uh, you know, limits you. you you're not going to have like, like you're not going to do what, for instance, Airstream does where, you know, they have like big metal ribs and then they skin it um, with an aluminum skin. So, I'd say like it, it was it was a it, it was a host of factors you know from volume to architecture that that ultimately led to like the decision to 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 and also I should talk mass is super important right like it's can be a lot a lot less you know lower lower weight um, that led us to our architecture um, and then and then and then we just had to be very um, clever about it so 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 going back to the sort of like technology question you asked us before like there there actually there there's actually quite a bit going on in that body in terms of how do you make it um, how do you make it, you know, lightweight, structural, um, relatively inexpensive? Um, how do you make the entire you know, can canopy be able to be able to articulate? Um, so it's, uh, it's been, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a, quite an endeavor. So I guess, and, you know, you mentioned like the architecture of it, like, what is it? So is it a, like material wise, what, uh, if you can discuss or at a high level is fine too, you know, I don't, if there's something proprietary or anything, 
Uh, and then like um, like a manufacturing process, and then uh, I guess joining process as well. Yeah, for the various panels. Yeah, we yeah we so we are. Um, th there's nothing like I think super proprietary or sure. like that interesting to say about like the materials. Like it's a you know a uh, you know composite molding process. Um, I, you know I can say like we're not we're not making a sort of like composite unibody, which is sort of like something like you know, Proterra my la in my last job where, mm -hmm. where, where it's like a, basically like a single part. Um, and, and it has to be structural and you're, you know, embedding like carbon fiber stringers in it. And it's, you know, super expensive and super labor intensive. Um, we, we, we are, you know, we, we've, we've taken an approach where we are, are building out of, you know, s you know, smaller composite, um, pieces mm -hmm. um and um and we're you know we do have a, a a metal chassis um that that uh you know that we're that we're sort of like building you know the, the body you know sort of kind of like a body body on frame um and and i think like you know that that is that is again it's 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 it's, it's, it's really a you know triangulation between a lot of like the you know, engineering product requirements and cost and mass and, you know, and, and, and assembly time that sort of got us to that, like architecture. So is it, um, I, I have like a, a, an elementary background with composites and, and kind of doing some stuff with body structure. I'm just, I'm kind of curious when you look at like, a, let's say like a Jeep or like a Bronco top, right? So those are, is it similar in construction to that? Like maybe like with, a, is it like a, are they kidding up essentially a series of, um, fiberglass or composite layers um and with insulation or things of that nature or is it like a one piece kind of insert that's being dropped into a mold yeah we i'm not i'm not quite sure how the assembly process works with with the jeep or, or those those um examples but um yeah i mean for for us you know you, you think about like it's a um you know uh uh like an you know you know you know uh, a vac form like open open like mold molded okay. like composite that's like creating a part and then you're bonding and then you're bonding you know pieces yep. of composite together to like fundamentally create like the body structure no i mean that makes sense too i mean especially so it's vac formed so like a one-sided tool uh which is nice because you're you're only paying yeah. for one right <laughs> so yeah um, Correct. yeah i mean yeah. no i mean it i'm just kind of curious like when i looked at it i was like it seems interesting of how it's put together and everything you kind of described seems you know like very cost effective for what you're what you're trying to do. You can get a lot of very complex shapes, control your material usage and things of that nature. Um, and you know, composites, like, like you were mentioning, like they kind of have this like buzzword with respect to them. You know, for some industries they're extremely exotic, and in others it's like the cheapest thing that they'll do. You know, um, yeah, exactly. But uh, I, what I think is interesting is you know, kind of speaking to like the the life cycle of the of the vehicle. Um, you know, they in many ways, you know, they can be like easily repaired. Um, and, um, they may like, you know, very well, like lend themselves to that aspect of being, you know, in service for quite a long time. Cause it's, it's a little bit different than like a body structure of a vehicle. Cause you're not occupying it. Right. Um, so is there, um, is that one of the reasons that you've kind of gone through that process is just the longevity and it's almost like a bolt hole, I guess. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, certainly I'd say like longevity is, is like, is, is, is a, is a, is a part of it, uh, that goes, that factors into the calculus as well. Like that's, 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 that's great. I mean, there, there's ways to, you know, Airstream, I'd say, for instance, has a reputation for, for being a product that lasts for a while mm -hmm. and people pass down Airstreams and that's, that's something that's made out of steel and aluminum and corrosive materials. But, um, but generally speaking, I think, yeah, composite composites can last a long time. Gotcha. Um, one of the things I was kind of curious about is, um, so like we kind of talked a little bit about the body structure. There's obviously a lot of like window openings. So it's, it's not just a car, right? It's a, it's a living space. Um, like what material are the windows and kind of how did you, you know, maybe balance out the amount of windows where they're placed? Um, because they're, um, you know, if they're glass, glass can be expensive and heavy. Um, if they're not, if they're a polycarbonate, then there's kind of, you know, different trade-offs there. Uh, just, and then just like the overall design, you know, feel of it, like it's big in the auto industry as well as like the greenhouse, how much open air and light you have coming into a vehicle, what that looks like from a cabin. Can you talk about a little bit about those trade-offs and kind of like what went into like the overall layout of the, the light chip? Yeah. I mean, maybe high level, just 
for those that are less familiar with it, like, yeah, like the, the whole concept of the vehicle is to make a very sort of like open living space um, that's, you know, connecting you to nature. And, and, and that's, that is very different in the RV industry. I think it's becoming more co- common in automotive where, you know, a lot of cars that are coming out will have like a full glass roof yeah. or um, just tons of glass. And um, in the RV industry, which, what, what is much more common is, is like, you know, much smaller windows. And, and, you know, frankly, I think a lot of RVs, you go on them and it feels a little bit like you're in a cave. Sure. Um, which, which is, you know, just, you know, not, not the approach that we wanted to take. Like you spend all this time going to some, you know, beautiful state park and, and then like, you know, we want, want you to feel connected with it. And, and then like, then, and then we also want to, you know, be able to, um, still provide you with privacy and, and, and things when, when you want it. Um, but anyway, that, that has led us to a, a layout that is, you know, a, a, a really sort of nice open floor plan, you know, with a, with like a you know, big open space, um, it's led us to a ton of glass on, on, on all of the surfaces to, to really connect you with, with, you know, your, your, your location. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in, in terms of like some of like the specific material choices, I, th- I think, you know, w- we are using a combination of glass and polycarb, um, and, and, um, and, um, it, this sort of like factors, you, you mentioned some of them, like it, all things being equal, you, you'd want to try to make things out of polycarb because it's lower mass and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, typically lower cost, but um, what we found is like the experience of there's there's downsides of polycarp. Uh, you know, if you don't if you don't treat it appropriately, it can scratch. It's it's harder to like control uh, the transparency. Um, it's it's like f- for windows that you want to open, it's it can warp in the sun and and so and so um, you know for us like you can't you can't be glass in in in, sure. in, 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 some, in some use cases so. So for us, like, you know, many of, you know, the windows, especially the ones that we want, um, you know, to, to open, um, uh, you know, gla- glasses, glasses is, 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 is the way to go. And then in others uh, uh, where, um, you know, opening is not a, require, you know, a requirement or it's in a part of the vehicle where, um, uh, you know, where we are, we're less concerned with, with like perfectly matching like tints or something like that, sure. then, then, we, then, we'll, then, we'll, then we can use a polycarb. No, I mean that's interesting. Are the upper windows ones that are kind of curved, you know, over into the um, the roof polycarbonate? Um, those are actually separate windows up on the top. Um, that there's you know there's there's sort of like uh, sort of like canopy structure in between those like top windows. Like oh, okay. The, Maybe I was looking at the wrong picture. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think our, our our plan is for those to be polycarb, the small ones. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know you're. The production facility that's kind of you know you're getting ready to stand up is there i guess um how much um from a, like a pilot perspective there you know do you are you guys kind of going through and like mocking up you know the various stations um that you could essentially use this as a like a forefront to full scale production, or is it truly like a pilot plant where you're essentially going to be building maybe on like one station and kind of get bits gets built all the way up um, from there? Yeah, no, I mean we use the term pilot, but but that doesn't quite do it justice. Like it okay. really is just like a small manufacturing facility. Um, it will we so you know we haven't we haven't. Um, currently like are, are constructing the line right now. So we haven't, we haven't started production. We haven't actually moved into the facility that that'll be early next year. Um, but it will be a, you know, proper assembly line, you know, it'd be like kind of a tr- traditional like U shaped assembly line. Um, it's not stall builds. Um, we, we will start with something that will look more like stall builds when we're doing our, you know, our, our very first builds will be, um, you know, engineering development units. Um, and then as we, you know, we get into, into, into sort of like, you know, regular production, it will, it will be a, you know, a, a proper assembly line. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that, 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 that's a facility that we you know we'll, we'll be able to scale into like the, the hundreds of units um, oh, okay. out, out, out of that. So it's, it's not like a, yeah, it's, it, we'll, we'll, we'll get some volume out of it. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I'm just kind of curious because they're, you know, when you look at how RVs are often built, like you said, like a house is a great analogy. That's essentially a lot, how a lot of them are built, you know? Yeah. Um, and that warrants, um, many of the quality issues, if you will, um, or strategies that are used to essentially build them that are, um, very unautomotive like, um, from the perspective of 
like getting those durability and kind of the features that you are fit and finish and things of that nature that you would expect from uh, an automobile. So, okay. So like you have a very, you know, finance lean, you know, with your, with your background. And one of the things that like, you know, as a, that Sandy often says is, you know, he'd often rather talk to finance people than engineers. Um, cause you know, engineers will tell you why they can't do something. Um, um, where finance people really will drive a lot of change at times. So like from the scope of Lightship, like what, what would you say like your, your finance background has really helped like scope how this project was developed, uh, like, you know, coming into being or just even like, you know, uh, choices made throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate Sandy's perspective. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say that about <laughs> a finance, finance guy before, but, but I'll, but I'll take it. Um, I would consider myself a recovering finance guy. Recovering but not, finance. <laughs> but not very, not very well recovered. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so, so I, 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 have, I have many thoughts, but I mean, you know, one thing I think is kind of funny, like the, the partnership with Ben and I, we'll joke about this, like, um, you know, we have very complementary skills and we have pretty different approaches. And a lot of ways, like Ben is, Ben is like the sizzle and I'm the steak. Like, 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 I think a lot of the, a lot of the, like, um, I think like really creative, like good ideas that like give a, give, give the company a lot of energy. Like, I, I, you know, this is not like exclusively the case, but I think a lot, a lot of times those, those come from Ben and that, and that, and that I think is like something that it's like amazing and, and what he brings to the business. And, and for me, I'm like much more like a creature of habit, like sort of like, let's, let's like, let's get this done. Like, 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 you know, how, how, how do we, how do we make it happen? I'm, you know, very kind of like op operationally minded. Um, and, 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 and that is definitely a lot of the finance background, but I, I would say like, I'm probably not, not your average finance person. I'm, I just have, you know, a specific, everyone has their own background. My, you know, my specific background, background is coming out of like Tesla finance and Tesla finance was like this, like really like ultra scrappy. Like I was, I was there during like sort of like depression era Tesla where like the company was constantly about turning out of money and it, and it, and it, it really instilled in me, frankly, to a fault, this just like scrappy mentality. And, um, you kind of like bring that to light ship. And I think it's been, it's been, it's been good and bad. And, and I'd say like, you know, the influence I've had, I have is like, I think we have been scrappier than any other company that would, that would be trying to do the same thing as us. Like, we spent less than $10 million to, to like, to like bring the, build up the team and like build out the entire product concept and launch it. And, you know, I think your typical car company probably spend 10 times that much. Um, but I think if you ask folks on the team, they probably would also tell you like, yeah, like Toby should have let us hire like that, you know, extra technician like months ago or like why, why, you know, why is, why is he sweating, you know, whatever this, this detail is. So it's double edged sword for sure. Um, but ultimately, I'd like to, to think that like it, it will be um, a reason for why why we are successful because at the end of the day, like we you know we're designing a, a product that I think is 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 revolutionary. It's it's awesome. It's game changing. It's really unique. Like I I I'm I'm I think it's I think it's just just awesome. And I think you know the brand we're creating is awesome. Like all this stuff is is really cool. But um, in order for us to matter as a company, in order for us to make a difference, in order for us to like bring you know great product to our customers like we do need to build a, a great business behind that and um and and i think you especially look at like the electrification mo movement in the last couple of years like there's a lot of companies that have sort of lost sight of that you know they've they've like come out with cool concepts and they've gotten a bunch of attention and you know a couple of years ago they went public probably like two to five years earlier than they should have and 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 now like well, the electrification movement's kind of suffering because of it because because there's just a lot of a lot of um, um, companies that I think didn't didn't build like a good a good business model behind right. uh, what could be a really great product. And I, I want to respect your time with this, but I, I'm just kind of curious: is there like a particular example, like from a finance, or even just when you're talking like like trade offs? I mean, because that's when it comes to car anything right that you're engineering it's it's time money materials you're just you're always in this balancing act is is there maybe like somewhere in the in the in the vehicle where um let's say you guys decided to spend more money 
to save money long term, whether it be like a, a potential warranty issue or anything like that, where you you took like a big, you know, plunge some in a particular aspect of the vehicle. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, so so yeah, like I, I think one of the one of the first things that we did when we were developing a product concept, and I'm glad we did, was we sort of like wrote down a list of like things that we we would not compromise. Like, what is the e- essence of this product? And 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 um, you know, there was a lot on that, but but you know, so, some of the things that were really high on the list was was a lot to do with, with like the technology, of the vehicle, and in particular, like. Um, you know how the, you know the energy of the battery and and the so like solar like the solar power and you know like why does that matter because is because if you look at like the user experience you know we, we we want to create a vehicle that you could live off grid in for a week um so you know it would be really nice if we could make our battery system smaller or our solar system smaller um but those are things that we have decided we would not compromise on so you know you look, you look at like the the the, um, the roof of the vehicle and we're we're, we're putting solar in, in every part of it that we can and you look at the battery like um, we'll have the largest battery system of any RV I should say any towable RV I think sure ever um, and I mean, it's larger than vehicles right yeah you it's know. exactly it's it's larger than some EVs um, so um, yeah I'd say I'd say there are certain certain areas where you know, I, I guess I go back to like, I, sure, I'm a finance guy. I'm also a product guy. Like, I, I think it's like really important to like find find the right balance there. And, sure. And, and there's some stuff that like it is definitely worth spending money on. Yeah. No, I mean, and I would kind of agree. You know, as, as someone just looking from the outside, um, I'm not necessarily like in the market per se, but for other customers that kind of come to this, you know, some of these things and anything in electrification, I'm like, if you can leverage it while you're not using it, you know, like whether you had like a, like a quad or something like that, like, so the ability to have, you know, power to grid is a huge selling point because you know, that the batteries are expensive. There's no getting around that aspect. But when you're, when you're looking at trying to make that purchase, um, it's something that can, can have continual payback, right. You know, with it, you can, you can use it to run things off of, you can, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be gained, I think from like, um, energy resilience from that perspective. And the fact that it has solar that's integrated as well is, is very interesting to me. Yeah, um, yeah that's so. something we're, 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 we're really stoked about. Uh, you know, your, your typical RV is sitting around not being used for 48, 49 weeks a year. And um, and because of, you know, like what I was just saying, like we have we have a big battery we're not gonna compromise on. We have a big solar system we're not gonna compromise on. So so you should absolutely make the make the, the best uh, you know use out of that. Um, 365 days a year and that's why we you know we've we've made the, the vehicle bi-directional you can back up your house you can charge yeah. your ev like and, and that's that's something that we're, we're pretty stoked about yeah no it's it's very interesting and and realistically I, I truly think it adds a lot of value you know just especially for the long-term aspect of it you know um yeah. not yeah. That, like again i wasn't trying to poke fun about like the offsetting the carbon aspect of it but something that you're talking about that could be used literally every day even if you're not using it uh potentially yeah. is is very interesting so yeah, no, totally. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about it. Um, is there, again, I, I want to respect your time. Is there anything you kind of else wanted to, you wanted to speak or kind of discuss, you know, about the light ship, you know, prior to kind of signing off? Um, you've been pretty thorough. I, I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you. I've talked more about, uh, windows and composites than, than, uh, than I have, uh, in, in a while. Um, so I, I, I have a long think, list of things, but we don't yeah. have time for it. So. Yeah. I think, I think you've gotten deep and yeah, you've, you've, you've explored some of the topics. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have anything else to, to cover. Okay. Um, well, Toby, I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time for, to talk to us. Um, I know I've said it like three or four times now it's, I find it very interesting, like generally speaking, you know, so I think it, there's a, um, it offers a lot. And I think there's a, I think just like a lot of like a simple execution. I know it's not a simple, you know, product per se, but when you look as far as what is moving, how much is moving and things of that nature, um, I think it's, I think it's very interesting. Uh, you know, I wish you luck and it's very kind of exciting to see where this goes from, from here. You know, it's a, an interesting segment and, uh, that I like to kind of keep an eye on. So. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for the, thanks for, thanks for doing the, doing the story and, um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're excited. Let's, let's definitely keep in touch as we get closer to production. No, awesome. That'd be great. So thanks again. I appreciate it. Cool.